You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner. Incredible. We're going to hop right into this interview. We have Martin Chorzempa with us. The topic is the end of cash. He has written a groundbreaking book. It's interesting with something so new that someone could write a history on it, but it's called The Cashless Revolution, China's Reinvention of Money and the End of American, America's Domination of Finance and Technology. I've been following China as best I can for quite a while, and they're way, way ahead of where we are. And so we have an expert, a uh, magnificent book, fabulous. Uh, Martin Trzempa, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Tell us, first of all, a little bit about your background in what led you uh, to write this book and your experience in writing it, because it's in depth. Um, it's in three sections. Uh, it talks about the, the financial you know, repression and the rise of Chinese tech. Then you use an interesting uh, phrase here, the Cambrian explosion, which, you know, for something in the future, you know, Cambrian explosion, for those that might not be familiar with the term, you know, from what I understand of it, it's a period uh, in, uh, in prehistoric times where we just had this incredible infusion of life, uh, just an explosion of, of biologic activity. And then, uh, and then we're going to talk about control and the expansion and where things will go in the future in part three. So tell us a little bit about, about your background and what led you to write this magnificent book. Sure. So I, I've always been interested in finance and um, majored in finance as an undergrad in Minnesota and then got a Fulbright scholarship to go to Germany and learn about its banking system. But, you know, I was thinking this is about 2012 that if you want to understand the future of finance uh, and, you know, the global economy, you really got to understand China because at that time it still is the rising power. Uh, it's not really uh, Europe where you're going to, you're going to find the future. So in mid 2013, I moved to Beijing and discovered this really backward financial system. You know, this is a rising superpower, but most of the people are doing all their payments in cash. They don't have credit cards. They have very limited investment options with uh, interest rates that are capped by the government. And, you know, I, people were using Venmo uh, in the U.S. to split bills more than anybody in China was using something like Alipay, a mobile mm -hmm. phone app, to, uh, to do any of that in China. So I arrived there and, and felt like I was kind of going back in time in, in finance. But then something really extraordinary occurred while I was living there. And, um, and the excitement of living through it is what made me really want to devote a whole book to, to how this happened. You know, this is uh, just under a decade ago. And in only a few years, China went from this backward state dominated financial system to a brand new one that was all digital. You know, people in China don't need to uh, bring wallets with them anymore because one app or two apps can uh, can complete just about any transaction that you would need dozens of apps uh, here in the West to do. Everybody pays for things digitally. Uh, my favorite anecdote is even beggars uh, in China don't even bother asking for cash anymore because no one has it. So they hang these uh, printed QR codes that you can scan uh, around their necks so that people who want to help them out can uh, send them a digital payment. Uh, and sometimes when robbers go around and try to hold up stores, they find that there's no cash in the cash register because everybody's been paying digitally the entire time. And then I moved back to the United States uh, to go to graduate school, and suddenly I have to use paper checks again. Hmm. And I have to carry my wallet and use plastic cards, and now it's like, wait a second, I thought I went back in time when I went to China. Now China's left ahead, and it feels like the U.S. is the one uh, that's behind. So I wanted to figure out, you know, why didn't, we really have a digital finance revolution in the United States. And why did we have one in China, a place that you might think wouldn't be too friendly to innovation because it's very state uh, dominated, authoritarian, one party state. And we're the ones who have Silicon Valley and all these really strong tech companies. But this extraordinary thing happened there and not here. And I thought this is, this is worth writing a book about. It's absolutely essential education. In the nineties, we had a, uh, maybe an information age we enter. World Wide Web, email, 
uh, high protects transfer protocols, new languages for people to learn, new skills to learn. You know, how do I point and click? And, and people had a, a big introduction to technology. It seems there's a second wave um, with decentralized finance, blockchain technologies, Web3, probably not as big a deal in my mind as, as blockchain is. And in my mind, you know, Bitcoin is to crypto and digital currency as Netscape was to the World Wide Web. It's kind of the first one, but I, I just think the obsolescence risk of, of that type of technology is huge when you consider what China's doing, the need for control. So let's let's talk about the scary stuff. <laughs> People in the U.S., <laughs> we'll jump right to the scary stuff. People in the U.S., and maybe this is my own projection, I very much uh, enjoy my privacy. I very much enjoy my personal freedom. And I think there's a certain segment of the U.S., maybe not conspiratorial. I'm not that nutty. I'm not a you know a crazy man. But I, I look at someone like China, and you, you know I've never lived there. So maybe I have a, a bad vision of it, but I have this vision of everything being tracked and algorithms. Like if a person today in the U S wants to go get a loan, uh, maybe the bank looks at your financial statement. Uh, you go to China, perhaps they they're able to monitor so many things with this integration. Alipay. If you haven't read about Alipay and ant that became ant Alibaba, the integration of your social media life, your social behavior. I've even heard things that they even monitor your cell phone charging habits and that there's algorithms that determine how society treats you. Um, can you talk about that? Is that a, a, a founded fear or is that just uh, being afraid of, of things that are good and new? No, it's uh, it, this is one of the most fascinating paradoxes of, uh, of the book is that these technologies can be used for creating freedom and convenience for people. And it can also be used for social control. So it's a, it's a delicate balancing act trying to think about how we can harness the benefits without the cost. So yeah. one, one example is, is credit. Uh, in the United States, people have been using credit cards for you know, 60, 70 years. Uh, most people have a well-established credit history that the bank can look at to decide to, whether to give you a loan. Well, uh, in China, not too long ago, almost nobody had a credit card and so no one had a credit history. If you wanted to get a loan, you had to go to some loan shark around the corner who would you know, beat you up if you couldn't pay back the loan. But then these companies with all this data on you could say, hey, we don't have a traditional credit history, but we have all this other information that might be really useful in predicting whether you're gonna be a loan risk. One of the funniest examples in the US is actually uh, people who buy those little felt pads to put underneath the legs of their furniture tend to be really good credit risks. So you might not have any credit history on this person, but if you look at their purchase history on Amazon and see they're buying the felt pads, uh, that shows that they're conscientious. They care about not scratching up their floors. They probably have a decent house. You know, it's, it's a proxy for things that you can't measure directly. And so these, uh, these companies, through their vision of everything that people uh, was doing in China, were able to control fraud really well. They know where you are and what you buy. So if you try to buy something that you know, is inhabitual, they might say, hey, that looks like fraud. And then they're also able to expand credit to you. And that's, that's super positive, actually. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, there's a risk of combining all this data together uh, out in one place. And we really see this with the way that they uh, brought these fintech companies to help implement COVID controls. So at the very beginning, when COVID first hit China, they had to lock the whole country down. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to figure out how can some people get, uh, get out and go back to work. Otherwise, their economy is going to completely collapse. And they asked uh, Alibaba, they asked uh, Ant Group, you know, this, uh, this private tech company to come up with an algorithm that determines who is high risk and who is thus maybe going to have their door welded shut and their fire escapes sealed and who are the people who are going to have a green code and can go out to uh, go back to work and do their groceries and things. And so this is just extraordinary power. And it comes because these, these apps were so ubiquitous. They just could just assume that everyone is going to have these codes. But of course, there's a line in the code for that app that says, send your info and location to the police. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and thus, these, these, these apps, which for a while were these incredible 
tools for, uh, for ending financial repression and giving people choice in their lives could actually be enlisted to control their movements. Yeah. And that's what we've seen people protesting against uh, in recent days is just the draconian controls that are implemented with the help of these apps. The paradox you mentioned, it's fascinating. I think about the U.S. and uh, maybe a personal pet peeve of mine is when, you know, someone will say, hey, if you pay me with cash, I'll give you a little discount because they're cheating on their taxes. I mean, yeah, it's, it's just a sign mm. that says I'm dishonest, right? It just, it kills me that people don't feel that cheating on their taxes is a mark on their integrity. It blows my mind. I mean, they just, that's ah, the government who cares. So, you know, if you, the, the, the reason I don't think a government likes the idea of Bitcoins and they, they want to track stuff, they want to control stuff, they, they don't want fraud, they want their share, they want control. So that's where I think it's not the technology, it's the people with the power that still, you're not going to, I just don't know that you circumnavigate because the moment you say, well, I'm going to do a things a different way the government doesn't want me to, I think your life is a risk now because you're outside of what the government is telling you to do if we had a digital currency in the u.s where everything was tracked it would eliminate uh how much fraud you know probably billions and billions probably hundreds of billions in tax revenue would be brought in um because people will lie and they will defraud so freedom has its has its cost because people are going to abuse it can you speak to that what are the what are the controls in china uh, that could, you know, metastasize, I guess is the word I would use. What are the thing? what are your concerns as you see this grow? Yeah. Well, one, one thing on the, on the cash point that I think is important, uh, on the one hand there, there is a lot of tax evasion going on with cash. On the other, if you talk to some coffee shops, for example, they might spend more money on credit card fees than they do on coffee beans mm. because in the U S uh, using credit cards, it's very expensive. Uh, yeah. that, ha- that pays for all the fancy rewards and fee- free travel that uh, people with nice credit cards like you and I probably yeah. uh, have that, you know, that gets paid for by everybody. Um, and, and so there's a reason why they might want cash, even if they're not, uh, even if they're not doing something nefarious, they might just want to save on those credit card fees. Whereas in China, it's so much cheaper that people were willing to adopt it. Um, in terms of the things that might metastasize, I think it's a really good point. You know, everybody's thinking now in Washington, how do we compete with China? Yeah. And if China has this new digital currency that its central bank wants to launch, that might be able to track everything that people in China do. Do we need one of those too uh, for our own competitiveness? But you know, one of the reasons we might not want that here is is that it's really hard to do that in a privacy preserving way you don't want the government to have a record of everybody's uh retail payment transactions you want there to have to be you know the serve a warrant or you know do a you know legal process to serve your bank to get that kind of information rather than directly collecting it on on everybody in order to preserve civil liberties so i think you know the the alluring power of this model in china is inspiring a lot of people to try and emulate it and it's not just the government you know mark zuckerberg at um, at facebook now meta was definitely inspired directly by china when he wanted to launch this new global currency called libra yeah and uh, elon musk is now saying he wants to turn twitter into an everything app which looks a lot like what uh, exists in China. So what we see is these ideas in China look so powerful that people who might be able to implement it in you know, the U.S. and around the world, they want to do the same thing. And it's really up to us to make sure that if they do it, uh, there's enough privacy preservation, that we don't have new monopolies being formed. You know, That's really the priority to make sure that the bad elements of the system don't end up finding their way on our shores too. What will be interesting to me is the psychological impact. You know, governments are about behavior. How do we want people to behave? Uh, I'm going to track your alcohol purchases so I know that part of your life. Therefore, people, you know, sunshine is a disinfectant. Well, I'm going to buy less alcohol and uh, maybe I'm not going to buy tobacco. And well, wouldn't that be good? But, you know, even though you might get the behavior, 
I just matter. I imagine. I mean, I'd like to know because you live there. What does that do to a, a society psychologically, where you have a minder on everything you buy, everything you tweet, everything you say, everywhere you go? There's facial recognition software. I mean, when you're constantly minded all the time in every area of your life now, what does that do to a, a limbic system? What does that do to a cortisol level of psychological health? Uh, walking on eggshells, so to speak, or do people just, ah, I don't care if they know what I do. I've lived a good life. Or do I panic with a rumor that says, I'm going to go in the felt, in the felt business. You know, I actually do have tabs underneath my furniture. So I guess, I guess I can get a loan, but now I need to go out and buy this other stuff and misinformation and, and trying to comply and figure out what algorithms are. So I know how to behave. Does that, I mean, I think that would make some people just schizophrenic, just nuts. Yes. Um, you know, what's really interesting is, uh, you know, the media often get a lot of things in China wrong because of how difficult it is to understand things going on there. Yeah. And here, I think you're referring to the social credit system, which is probably the most, uh, misunderstood system. Uh, what you have is, you know, Alibaba and its financial affiliate and created a credit score system for people called the Sesame credit. And that mm -hmm. takes into account, they say, hey, if you're buying diapers, you're probably a responsible parent. If you're buying just booze and cigarettes, we might lower your score a little bit. Right. But ultimately, that, that really only affects your ability to get loans from Alibaba. Like the bank is not going to reject you from a credit card because you bought alcohol. Uh, so people don't really, aren't really super concerned about that. And then there's this big social credit system, which people think is like some citizen score, which yeah. you, know, it, you have to be watching, but it's really like if you pull the fire escape on the train and stop it, they're going to bar you from taking trains again. If you have like a court judgment against you, you can't, uh, you can't be going out, staying in five-star hotels, taking first class, uh, the plane flights while you owe your creditors a bunch of money. It's, it's, you know, there are Orwellian elements of it, but it's not as nearly as scary as people think. And actually what I find in the book that's so fascinating to me is there are all these areas where the Chinese government has no idea what's going on. You know, there's this huge bubble of peer to peer lending kind of like, you know, in the U S it was known as marketplace lending with lending club. And there were these huge internet platforms doing like billions of B in loans and the government had no idea what they were doing. They didn't know that there was just this rampant law breaking going on. <laughs> yeah. So you find that there, we have this vision of this Chinese state as all seeing all knowing, you know, that the people are just all falling into line and uh, following what the government says. And what you find is actually like China is a very messy and often very lawless place. And you see that the people whose lives were controlled for so long by these COVID scores, you know, if you've been paying any attention to the news over the last week, you'll see that, you know, at a certain point, the psychology breaks and people say, I've had enough of getting a red code locking me in my, uh, locking me in my room. I've had enough of being sent to a quarantine facility because I wanted to go out to a restaurant and someone who saw someone who had COVID was there. And, you know, even though there are cameras everywhere, even though everything's being tracked, we're getting these images of these protests yeah. and people are rising up. So it's uh, it's just a really fascinating place. That's not nearly as said and controlled as people like to think it's in uh, chapter four section two of your book it's called the fintech wild west and the the heading is we are not or we are not working entirely within the rules of law and that's an interesting thing because you do think of china as this as this uh, place where you know like singapore when you go to singapore i'm totally safe there i would send my kids out in the middle of nowhere because there's just no crime because they really do a good job in singapore with their uh you know with their penalties frankly so i kind of like it if i guess if you're if you're a lot of buying citizen it, it, it can be a good thing can you talk about bitcoin there was a big rise China had a, a big rise of Bitcoin. How did that get nixed? And, and what's your feeling on things like Ether and Bitcoin? Where, do, do those fit in? Or, or is it really more like Alibaba type stuff, Ant type stuff, the stuff Musk wants to do? What's the future of currency? Yeah, good question. So China, uh, China found that people there really want to get around controls. And that means, you know, 
tax, taxation, tracking, but also keeping money on shore. So tons of people in China suddenly started using Bitcoin in 2013 in ways that the government really didn't like. Uh, but they really couldn't figure out for a long time, do we want to ban this thing that we can't control? Or do we want to try to find some way to control how Chinese people uh, can can use it? And I think ultimately, after a few years, they determined that this Bitcoin stuff and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies were really just about speculation that they judged, at least, wasn't really going to create any societal value for them. Mm-hmm. All it was going to do was put uh, subject China to risk that people are going to you know, funnel their money out of the country, risk that all these old grandmas would be convinced to buy, you know, mm-hmm. invest in something like FTX <laughs> tokens yeah. uh, that would blow up later on and then lead people to protest in the streets against the government for not protecting them. Uh, so China is generally judged that you know crypto is something they want to sit out on. And uh, if you think about the future of currency, at the same time you have governments around the world are thinking about how they can harness this technology behind Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies to maybe make payments more efficient, cheaper, and better in their countries and across borders. So there's a real global movement to to create new forms of digital currency, but these things are very much in the early stages. Um, if anything, we, we see uh, China's experiment as, uh, on creating its own public sector digital currencies. People don't really seem to want to use it. Uh, they're pretty happy with the payment tools that they already have, which are run by private uh, private companies. So I think the, the really the biggest question is less a technological question, but more of do we want the government to be playing a much bigger role than they do now in payments, or do we want to leave it up to the market? And sometimes leaving it up to the market is really expensive. And, uh, and other times leaving it up to the government means we're not going to have much innovation. It might be pretty ossified. So, you know, how we deal with those trade-offs is going to be different in each country. And I think the U.S. is probably going to, you know, chart some middle ground where we say we don't like the completely anarchic stuff that's in Web3 or Bitcoin. That's not really going to be the future. But we don't necessarily need something as centralized as we have now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we find somewhere in the middle. It will be interesting. The, The book we're discussing is The Cashless Revolution. China's reinvention of money and the end of America's domination of finance and technology. Let's talk about the latter part of that. America, uh, the U.S. has what we call the world reserve currency in the U.S. dollar. It seems like it seems like we're back trading seashells. It seems so antiquated automatically. America's domination of finance and technology. China seems pretty good at stealing stuff. Uh, so that gives them maybe a leg up. They seem really good at developing stuff. They have tremendous potential for AI. I don't know much about it, but I feel that AI is fed by data. And when you have this amount of data that's collected, uh, less privacy more means more data. They have more people to collect it on. It just seems like they are very fertile for getting the best AI, the best t- technology and that's really like the space race, like Sputnik of the 60s, 50s, you know, the space race. Uh, it seems like there's a new space race for AI. China's going to win this race, aren't they? You know, it's, it's, um, it's not just one space race. It's multiple races. You know, AI comprises a lot of different things. And in areas like uh, facial recognition, image recognition stuff, the fact that they have all these surveillance cameras feeding into their AI companies, yeah. Uh, means that they're quite advanced. And the fact that they're willing to allow a lot of autonomous vehicles on the road, gathering all that data, that's another benefit to them. But we have something that, that China does not. We, have, we are a beacon in the United States for all the best talent worldwide, including Chinese. A lot of times when a Chinese person goes and gets a PhD from MIT, uh, they want to stay in the United States. If, mm-hmm. And if we'll let them, they'll stay in the U.S. and contribute to our AI development instead of China's mm-hmm. AI development. So I, I, I do want to say, despite the kind of apocalyptic sounding subtitle, um, that the U.S. has a ton of advantages. And as long as we're not complacent, as long as we continue to, to innovate, we really can continue to, uh, you know, to, to be the leaders. And, you know, one, one thing to consider is, 
most of the big payments that happen worldwide that mean that people use the dollar, they're all digital payments uh, already. And there are all sorts of ways without creating some all seeing scary uh, central bank digital currency. There are all sorts of ways that we can upgrade those systems and make them more competitive in the future that leads China less space to, uh, to disrupt what we can do. And one of the things we see internationally is that these companies that were super great at FinTech in China and completely remade its financial system have largely lost out to American big tech companies like, you know, uh, WhatsApp owned by Mm -hmm. Meta Mm -hmm. slash Facebook. You know, they've really eaten the lunch of the Chinese in, uh, in many markets and social media. And now we're building payments on top of that, uh, and are in a better position than the Chinese. So, you know, my, my message to the U S is don't be complacent but don't be uh, fatalistic either. How important is it for individuals to keep learning in uh, areas of financial education in this day and age? From what you've seen in your travels, you have a great perspective. Do people need to, when you say don't be complacent, to me that sounds like learn. Absolutely. You know, there are so many new things occur uh, happening in finance. And, uh, you know, one of the things to consider is, you know, learn about the risks really try to learn. So if you think about these blockchain, Bitcoin stuff, don't just listen to what the people trying to sell you a coin have to say, really try your best to understand. And if you don't understand it, it's probably not worth investing in because uh, you're going to take a lot of risks that you don't, uh, that you don't understand. So I'd say in terms of investing, I personally am pretty conservative in what I do. Um, but I think, you know, if you want to understand the way the world is changing, you really have to keep up with, uh, the, the new technologies and we as a country need to make sure that we're, uh, we have people who, who have that understanding in our, our building. I recommend the cashless revolution, China's reinvention of money and the end of America's domination of finance and technology. You've been so gracious, Martin. I I just wish you the best. I I hope you would come back as these things unfold, if we invite you back and and give additional insight as uh, as this story continues to be told. Uh, But just absolutely fabulous, and we're so grateful that you spent a little time with us today. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Thank you for the excellent question. This has been the Cashflow Academy podcast. I'm your host, Andy Tanner, where we do our very best to making make investing simple. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.